Good evening, please, Aaron. Uh, khair, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining our round table on, and conversation on the power of music and counter culture. Uh, my name is Himmat Zabi, and I'm a Yumi Fellow and part of the ERGAC uh, Research Group. So uh, it's, a, it's a conversation, so it's not the regular panel. Uh, I will give a brief introduction about the panel or the round table, and then I will uh, post questions to our sp amazing speakers, and I will introduce uh, them before they speak. So in the era where creative industry has become very central in the economic global order, and image, sound, and digital platforms are dominating our lives, artistic mean had gained an increasing importance in social and political protest. Music is one of the key components of these tools. So in our conversation, we will try to highlight how musical production and performance channel political dissent and anti-authoritarian and anti-colonial struggles. It will discuss the relationship between music and social movement, social and political mobilization, collective identity, free spaces, and emotions. And how music, sounds, lyrics, performance, technology, and sound archives challenge hegemonic on concepts and practices related to political conflict, identity, gender, and sexuality. Thank you for joining me and for accepting the invitation. <laughs> I will start with the, an alphabetic order, uh, so to make it fair. And maybe I will start with you, Inanna. My opening question will be to give you five till up to seven minutes to to explore and to talk more about each of her, his, their work. So I'll start with you, Inanna. Let me introduce you. Dear friend, Inanna. So Inanna is Sumerian goddess of love, war, sex, and fertility. And my, much like their name, Inanna is multidimensional artist. Inanna is a trans non-binary rapper singer, songwriter, performer, and activist. Their artistic, uh, their artistic engine motivated by the pursuing for freedom and social justice. In the past years, they have been nurturing a unique sound that represent their intertwined existence being born in Damascus and based in Berlin since 2015. So my question to you, Inanna, is specifically about hip hop and the importance of this music genre, genre to counter social and political oppression and domination. And maybe if you can share with us what the circumstances were behind choosing this genre of the hip hop knowing that you used to sing, to write, and to perform. So if you can just take, lead us into okay. this. Hello, everybody. Um, I will talk about my personal experience, like the thing for me, why it is for me that way, and not in general. Um, I think you can say that like me and my character and my personality is very like, uh, how to say, uh, hot blooded. And, um, and things for me are just like, bam, 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 you know? And uh, that's, that's the whole thing about hip hop and rap in specific because it gives the all the punchlines, you know, it gives the punches and it has, it gives space to discuss things. It gives space to discuss political ideas and to, uh, uh, or opinions in a much bigger, uh, yeah, space, really. Um, Let me think about it. 
Yeah, yeah. Basically, for me, like for me, like all my thoughts and ideas and the message that I carry with me, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's gender politics or uh, queer politics uh, or race politics, everything like everything that I want to say is always elaborative, and uh, it needs the space that rap really provides, at least for me, I think. Plus, it has also it gives again another bigger space for the emotions behind it. Um, the, all the emotions that I carry specifically like anger, so much anger, you know, so much anger um, that can be translated uh, through hip hop or rap specifically, like even simply by the way you pronounce the words, uh, simply by the way you spit or again as i said already like punches you know because the feeling is punching me on the inside so i want to translate that i i want it um i want to transfer this emotion and uh, plus a little bit in general yes uh i feel that rap in specific can be very um it is already, it's already a space designated for politics, I feel, you know? I mean, what does, like, um, and the way to be political and poetic at the same time, you know, because I don't, I don't, I'm not a politician. I don't want to give speeches and uh, lectures. Uh, I want to, I, uh, I want to, I want to share me which is very political, but yet very poetic and very romantic, you know. Um, and I lost my plot, but... <laughs> Do you wanna say something about the anger? Reason, motivation? Yeah, of yeah. course. Are you, are you sure you wanna hear that? <laughs> are you sure you're ready yeah. for that? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Okay, for me, like, um, growing up, uh, you see, I did that. See, I did that. <laughs> Talking about anger, Talking about uh, anger. manifesting yes, anger. Sure. Yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, like growing up, for example, um, super gay. <laughs> And not, not even gay, like put gay aside, like super different, you know, just being really different from a very, very young age in our region. And um, facing a lot of, uh, let's say, rejection, suppression, oppression, ostracization. Um, yeah, and that you, you, you grow up, the first thing you realize that you're, you're really different, and then you realize that you're gay, and then you realize that uh, you're a gender fuck, and you, you, try to, you try to find a place, you try to find a space, and you don't, really. And, of course, as you can imagine, like that creates like suppression creates compression, which creates tension. Therefore, a lot of anger and frustration. And uh, yeah, and I grew up being a really, 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 really angry bitch. Like I was a big angry bitch. I still am in, in many ways, but uh, and then and then, yeah, as, as a teenager, let's say, uh, dreaming and fantasizing about uh, Europe and thinking it's uh, going to be utopia and uh, all your problems are going to be solved and life is going to be better. And then you arrive to Europe. And then you realize that actually, uh, no. <laughs> Actually, no, it is not better. And uh, and then you st actually like you you face even more systems of domination, and that you have to fight against every single day on in multitude. And 
so where does that anger have really a space to be released? It doesn't. Um, you go from fighting against homophobia and transphobia, and then you get in, you you have racism added on top. And yeah, and I think like for years I've been trying to find my voice. As you said, like I've been a musician since I'm a kid. I could sing and I could write at the same time, but I uh, never managed to create my own my own track. Let's say my own original piece. And for years, I always like wondered why, like why, and I tried so many different things, and it could never work. Until I guess I got to a point where that anger like just exploded, it exploded, and yeah, it exploded into rap bars. Expo it exploded into verses of me just like trying to release that anger, that tension in a way, while I could still tell people what the fuck, you know, instead of romanticizing things or, well, I'm not saying that that is what necessarily other genres of music does, you know, but for me, that's what it would have done, you know? And yeah. this is why like finding rap was a big, yeah, release, let's say. Thank you, we will get to, yes. to your work Later I thought you on. said we'll get to your war. I was like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> war, we're living in the war. So but to your war, okay, we will get to this later. Thank you so much, Inanna. Let me now uh, move to you, Diana. So uh, also a dear friend. Let me introduce you first before introducing the question. So Diana Abani is a writer, historian, and researcher associate at the Forum Transregional uh, Studium. She received her PhD in Arabic studies from the Sorbonne University, and she holds double master in history and political science. She is currently preparing a book on Beirut's social and cultural history in the first half of, of the 20th century. Her research focuses on music, memory, and language, and we will speak more about this in our coming question. So my question to you, Diana, what does the research of, on the history of music, music production in Beirut reveal about social and political transformation in Beirut and in Lebanon? And since your work also about the uh, uh, music production, so how do sound technologies reflect social changes and impact them? Um, thank you, thank you, Hemat. I'm very happy to be here, actually and to be on the same panel with these lovely uh, people. Uh, and thank you for this question. Maybe I, um, to answer this, I would like to start from what Inanna was saying a little bit about, uh, about her, uh, th about the rap of being like a, a way to, a space for politics, but also a space for the, for the personal, for the poetic also. And, um, and this is, I think, what's the core of my work, um, or this is what interests me actually uh, when I um, work on the music. I'm actually a historian, so I work, I use the music as a medium, as a tool also to, um, to understand the society, to understand uh, the changes and the transformation that happened. I focus mainly on Beirut, but like um, it's, uh, uh, I follow also the connection along the different cities in uh, Bilad al-Sham, what you call the Bilad al-Sham, like Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, but also the connection with uh, uh, Egypt, now, so now uh, North Africa, but also Europe, because the technology is a medium that like connected all these places. Uh, so the music um, is, a, is a tool because it was like produced by, by, by singers, musicians, by like the people. So it, can, it enables me also to look at the history from below and not only to follow uh, what, what were the changes, the political, uh, the cultural uh, changes um, from, from the official narratives. While the music like, enables you to go a little bit, and the song especially, enables you to go a little bit deeper, and especially the record industry, because when the record industry and the record companies arrived, to Bilad Sham around 1996, 
06. Uh, it changed the whole region. The region was already uh, being um, uh, very um, Im impacted by the global uh, changes, by the, uh, the global technologies that were circulating in the region, uh, the, um, the economic uh, also like um, openness to the to the, to, the to, to Europe and to to the rest of the region. And the record company companies like invaded the, the region and started recording the musicians, the singers. Uh, so this was linked to uh, business-wise, but also cultural and political, and it impacted the music. So you have this layer of how the technologies impacted the region, but you can also use it to see how the people on their way responded and used this technology to reflect, uh, to, to talk about politics, about the social, uh, about the modernity question, nationalism. So it has so many layers that you can enter the society, especially if you link it to the um, musical changes and the fact that um, uh, there, were, there were like a constant need or a continuous need to modernize the music and the musical scene. So you can see a lot of debates in the press on uh, uh, how we should modernize our music, how we should modernize, and the music is a way to modernize a society and to become civilized, to become modern. Um, so this also impacted the music, so music also changed. Uh, and the record industry helped shaping this music because before the music was like a um, uh, communal activity, in weddings, funerals, Okay, you, you, and, and in the Café Chantant or the, 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 the small café venues where the performer used to go, but, and, and some people had access. But when the record industry entered and the records, so these musicians uh, were recorded, the most famous one usually recorded, and uh, these records entered the home, entered the domestic life. So you have also new music, the music of the cabarets, the music of women songs and women um, marriage songs going into the houses. So this also impacted. Uh, but yes, it's a very, um, it's a very dynamic uh, uh, space to look at and to understand the changes, especially that um, in the 1920s and 30s, like they started recording um, nationalist songs uh, ideological, <coughs> socio-political critique of the society, of the society's westernization, but also the, the impact of colonialism. And uh, so you can also look at the, at the debates and how the songs eventually participating in shaping the modern uh, subject. Mm. So a lot of songs were very critical about the westernization, about how women are going out more and more, like going to venues, leisure venues, uh, uh, being um, uh, dressed in a certain way, uh, uh, lux luxurious way, and always, um, like the, the women were mostly uh, criticized for being outside, being in the public. Uh, so, and, and while they called for the women's education in songs, but in a certain way. Anyway, so, yeah, uh, the, 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 just to finish this, yeah. I mean, the, to, to, the music can, uh, and the record and the technologies, sound technologies can really, and going into this archive enables you to read a little bit uh, the margins also, so, yeah. Thank you, Diana, and I, I know we will get also to this that you, methodologically wise, you also a, a review and read the, uh, the radio archive, which also, it's not only the lyrics and technology, but also what had been written about it in the news. So to complete, and but we will get uh, back to this. Thank you, Diana. Uh, <clears throat> Mu'min. Uh, so let me introduce you first. Mu'min Swutat is a London-based Palestinian theater and filmmaker, music producer, DJ, and activist from Jenin. Mu'min trained at the Freedom Theater Bjenin and Art House, formerly London International School for Performing Art. He is the founder of Majaz, an, ar an archive of fin vintage Palestinian and Arab vinyl and cassettes and a record label based in East London. So, uh, uh, Mu'min, you have an amazing project. Majaz is really, really inspiring uh, a project that I would 
like you to introduce Majaz to us, if you please. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Hemet, for having me here, and thanks um, for the beautiful people here in the panel. Um, so basically, the Majaz project is uh, born out of the Palestinian archive. So, um, <clears throat> so um, obviously, the idea behind it is very clear, is just to prevent and preserve the Palestinian sound archive and, um, and uh, to uh, make it much more accessible um, and, um, and make it uh, sort of um, uh, amplify the, the Palestinian uh, music sound in, in our modern history now. So this is why we uh, decided to, um, because we had, um, we, 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 uh, um, we, like we basically uh, find ourselves in the middle of a place where we have over 16,000 Palestinian tape. Um, most of them was field recorded. Uh, uh, from uh, 1960 to, to uh, 2000. Uh, some of them was um, um, home recorded, home studio recorded. Some of them was professionally recorded in the studio and some of them was um, completely recorded in out, outdoor and demonstrations and um, in political uh, uh, debate and talk in, in, in Palestine and the diaspora. Um, uh, so we found ourselves in the middle of all of this um, uh, beautiful um, uh, treasure and, and we felt responsible and, uh, to, um, to, uh, to, ha to make this accessible to everyone. And, um, and this is um, what's, what's basically the idea behind Majaz. Majaz means uh, in Arabic jazz or experimental uh, because we also found a lot of um, Palestinian experimental uh, field recording, um, uh, as I mentioned, in, in demonstrations and in in, um, in the funeral and in the Shahid funeral, and um, and uh, during the clashes with the Israelis in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, so uh, um, and also the question of Majaz here come like, do we Palestinian have uh, a, a music that we can call Palestinian music? Um, or, um, or is this just a music p uh, played and sung by Palestinian? And also, um, what is like Palestinian music? And also, what is German music? And what is like English music? And all of this question, you know. So, because in the end of the day, all band play similar keys, similar keyboards, similar uh, instrumental, uh, or or we all play same same. Um, uh, um, gears, you know, in the end of the day. So is, is there is actually something called Palestinian music? And what if there is something called Palestinian music? What would sound, sound like? Um, so this is, this is all this question we always ask ourselves as a, as a label, young label, independent young label, uh, um, based between Palestine and, and London. And, um, and also um, our, our main... Um, 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 plan now is to reissue um, and to uh, release unreleased albums that have been recorded uh, but never been released or been actually taken by the Israeli army to the Israeli archive and not being shared um, 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 with the with uh, with the with the Palestinian generation who who live outside Palestine so they could actually. Um, look back in their heritage and, and culture, and sort of like uh, build this identity based on this, and and um, so the idea now is to release all of this archive on physical. Um, why physical? Because as a young, we strongly believe that the um, um, the time is it's not it's not really nostalgia. I hate the word nostalgia because we're talking about. Um, uh, um, uh, cassettes that have never been released before and young generation have not been listening to before. So nostalgia come into place where you actually grow listening to this music and then you come back listening to it again. So that's nostalgia. I'm talking about a lost archive that we had not, not been able to connect with. And um, obviously I'm not gonna blame the, uh, blame the occupation and everything that's happening to the Palestinian. Uh, but yes, it was a big part of it um, because it was difficult to distribute, difficult to release. We don't have, we were not allowed to have equipment 
um, in the West Bank and Gaza. Up to now, like, it's very difficult to ship um, a standalone CDJ, for example, to, to Janine. It would be like, or to Gaza, it would be very difficult to ship it there. So, um, so yeah, the idea, we strongly believe that by releasing uh, um, those music on vinyl and cassette, we will reconnect also with the young generation um, living outside of Palestine uh, who are interested in the music industry, um, who are collector, music producer, uh, songwriter, or record store or distributor. Um, because because we, uh, we strongly believe that uh, our voice should be um, uh, amplified and should be equalized and um, and it should be um, 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 found in a in a in a corner record shop here in Berlin uh, or anywhere else. So this is basically our project, Majaz project. Thank you, Mu'min. And I remember in our uh, conversation preparing to this, there were a lot of many beautiful stories about how music cassettes were distributed under the occupation, but also in the re-releasing of the unreleased, you also are going to put the story of each. So if you can just in briefly either talk about the distribution or about this yeah, uh, introducing I this uh, music to the uh, audience. Yeah, I will touch on both sides because they're similar things. So for example, um, um, we're talking about a um, Palestinian band uh, called Al Fajr, which means morning. And um, those band was established um, in the, in the um, early 1980s in Kuwait. Uh, just as they are recording the album, uh, the Iraqi invasion happened in Kuwait. So they have to um, to um, to become um, uh, displaced again. And from they were Palestinian kicked out from their home. I'm not gonna say the history again, but. Um, uh, and then there was uh, in, in, in Kuwait when the Iraqi invasion happening in Kuwait, so they didn't even finish their uh, their album. Um, but they were they moved, they came here to Berlin, okay. And um, it's not I'm not choosing this album because we are in Berlin and trying to make glamorize the album. But um, but basically uh, that's what happened. They came to Berlin and they recorded the album in Berlin in 1987. And they uh, uh, performed the album for the first time live in the Freedom uh, Voice Festival in Berlin. I'm not sure how many people know the Freedom Voice Festival in Berlin. Oh, okay, so the Majaz project also doing like a German archive things. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, the, Freedom, uh, the, the Freedom Voice Festival in Berlin is one of the most amazing music festivals have been started since early, uh, uh, late 70s. Uh, I think it stopped uh, late 80s. Um, and they were invited to play a live gig, gig which I have the film uh, of, of that live gig and the recording. And, and, um, and then after this, this album was never released um, because they have to move to a different location as a band and it was difficult for them to communicate. Not like today, you know, you can record your, uh, your voice and send it and then to the master and then uh, you can be in anywhere in the world and be a band. But um, but sadly, they didn't release it. So we are releasing it for the first time. So this is sort of unreleased music from the Palestinian archive. About distribution, um, basically distribution was, um, uh, was the, the very simple, <laughs> was a completely alternative distribution. It was you print uh, um, tape uh, exactly um, 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 like uh, exa the exact number of how many Palestinian cities in, 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 in inside Palestine, with inside Gaza, 48, and, and, and the West Bank. And then so basically each city will get one tape, okay? And this tape will be print in the city, not like, you know, like you don't print the whole, uh, the whole tapes and then start distributing them. And then once they got to, to each city, there will be one distributor uh, selling them in the street, in the market, uh, pretending that they will be selling uh, nuts and having a bin box and they will be playing the tape while they're selling nuts. And then will be, people will come to them and ask them, oh, what this music? They will be like, oh, give me money and then go to the falafel place and you can take the tape from there. <laughs> and they give them a sticker so that they, they have bait, so they go collect the, the, uh, the tape 
from like a different shop from around the places. So this is how they used to be distributed, basically. Yeah, thank you, because it's really interesting how political context shape the use of technology, how the unusing of the technology. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I just want I wanted to add also about the one more question about <laughs> is actually sound can be um, uh, something. Uh, that we can say, uh, oh, the sound can be part of a resistance. I'm not. I don't know. I'm just want to okay. ask this question. But yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can get uh, to this later. But we will move to our fourth speakers, uh, Muhammad Jabali. Uh, we. Yani, I, I, first, I want to thank you for joining in a sh very short notice because we uh, ha we invited. Uh, Mazin is Sayed, a Palestinian, a Palestinian, a Lebanese rapper, a Ross, but for a visa and renewal problems, a renewal a passport problems in Lebanon, he couldn't make it. So we invited Muhammad. Thank you for joining us, Muhammad. So Muhammad Jabali is a Palestinian artist, writer, children's picture, picture book author, and occasional DG based in Berlin. He was a faculty member at the Photography and Fine Art Department of the Betzalel Academy for Art and Design in Jerusalem and part of the teaching staff of the foundation class at Weizenzee Art School Berlin. And he is one of the founders of the Al Berlin Music Collective. But also congratulations, Mohammed, for your recent book, in the, in the trap of the space critical reading in the Israeli fine art field that published early this week. So thank you, Muhammad, and Mabrook. And Muhammad is also my partner, maybe I should say it. Okay, so my question to you. A minor detail. It's a, it's <laughs> a minor detail, he is also my partner. Okay. <laughs> so my question uh, for you, uh, Jabali, is very uh, is direct, is to tell us more about the Al Berlin Initiative and maybe to elaborate a bit about what was the rationale behind the Al Berlin first Arab contemporary music festival in Berlin, uh, three year, one year before the corona hit us. And thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me here. Um, really cool bash of people around. And uh, um, it's the, like, um, Let's say, we, like, we came to Berlin in um, a, in what seems still like a very um, interesting moment in um, in contemporary history of like after the like I've been visiting Berlin, I've performed here and had political talks, poetry readings, stuff before between let's say for example between 2006 and 2012 on several occasions, that was a, a certain experience of the city. And moving to Berlin after 2014-2015 is a total different experience in the uh, Arab feeling of it, in the West Asian feeling of it, in, uh, especially after the Syrian refuge. Uh, so these 10 years almost, of my experiences, it's like, I think it's, it's uh, um, the changes or the influx also, like what we experienced of the Arab Spring, of the Arab revolts, of what became later like the crisis in the whole area, what continued the crisis in the whole area in this phase, uh, how we experienced it there, and then like the possibility to, uh, um, be part of this in-building in community. Um, like we saw it as a great opportunity and might be like the right moment also to join forces and create like, um, like the ratio behind the Al Berlin initiative, like that it's um, um, trying to make a gathering like Al Berlin is in Arabic saying like the people of Berlin or the um, Al Berlin, like the family of Berlin. It's like in, in, in Arabic if you describe tribes, so it's like uh, Al Fulan is the tribe of Fulan or the descendants of uh, Fulan and uh, um, 
Yes, and then you could play on it. It's like, so the general initiative is Al Berlin. It's like creating like the tribe feeling, like the family feeling of collecting the community together around happenings, music, art, uh, in general. And then it becomes very easy to describe certain uh, specific events because it becomes then the shorter L. Uh, L festival, because anything you described in Arabic will become El Villa, El Conference, uh, especially when you talk in uh, El Jabali. El Jabali. <laughs> so especially also like when you talk in, uh, when, when foreign uh, words come into Arabic, they usually certain, like directly get uh, the L something uh, in it. And again, like also in Latin languages, the Al comes as from Arabic to Algebra, al kahul and so it's a kind of a play on uh, on a linguistic element between Latin and Arabic that gives you also to say the people and to say the events, and it it transforms between the Latin-based Europe and. Arabic, uh, Semitic uh, speaking back region, home region. The people of Berlin, the people of Berlin, Al Berlin, Al El Beit. <coughs> and um, like, because like, uh, <coughs> that's the <coughs> ratio, like the story goes that uh, uh, Ziad, uh, basically Ziad uh, Faid, I wanted to say Ziad Abani, which is Diana's partner, by the way. Uh, I wanted did. to say Ziad Abani. Ziad Abani came to Berlin, and he was part of many uh, different initiatives in uh, Beirut of uh, promoting music, making music happen, Beirut and beyond, and other festivals uh, promoting like independent Arabic music. I had my experiences in uh, um, also in music, like not only in art, music, whatever, but I was also DJing and making, like, producing lots of uh, music happenings back in Palestine. And we met in a, uh, in a Yumi uh, in uh, Europe, in the Middle East, Middle East and Europe Research Center uh, gathering over cafe and cake and talked about our experiences. Uh, and hey, like, it's like, there's a, like, you know, like we both uh, wanted to focus on like creating this idea of trying to find also our contribution in defining what is contemporary Arabic music. Like not only on the sound of it, but also on the relevancy of it, and also on this verge between, on the verge of being experimental, but still very pop and widespread. Uh, and like just taking this, argues or, or this are, uh, discussions around what is contemporary moment from the art field, taking it to the music, and trying to define through it what is our contemporary moment as Arabs, as West Asians, as North Africans. Uh, uh, what is our contemporary moment also artistically and also politically? And it's like, like I will add to the question before asked, it's like it's not only about it's like, you know, like, and for me, it's uh, uh, also a question is like, where does the Arab world happen? Yeah. So it's like a geographical terms, uh, like where does North Africa happens? It happens also in Europe, mm -hmm. because it's like ge geographical naming sometimes, uh, not only national naming, have this uh, restrictive, uh, like a restrictive effect on the imaginary because like it, it, it confines borders and puts it in a certain, tip. but also geographical terms ha do that. And the Arab world have been happening in Europe and in the United States and everywhere and in Asia and in Indonesia. So it's like saying, uh, 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 so geographical naming sometimes have also this national very restrictive naming on imaginary and on identities. So, and. I believe like Berlin is experiencing uh, a certain moment of this uh, contemporary Asian Arabic moment, also African moment of a refuge, 
documented, undocumented movement of people and uh, uh, immigration and into all of these crises we, we're, uh, and, and it's creating new opportunities as, as much as it's creating new crises. Yeah, we will get back to Berlin and the meaning of being in diaspora, exile, away from home, I think later on. Thank you, that this is what's really, really interesting. I want to move to, heck, to mix between two, because you touched on the technology and on the materiality of producing uh, Mu'min, but in my understanding, I see the fourth of you, you're working in, let, I can name it, to voice the unvoiced, right? So let us speak a bit about the social and political constraints and how doing music, performing music, writing about music challenges these constraints. And maybe we start with you, Diana about your work about the, uh, about the female singer from the early uh, 20th century. And what can you tell us about researching and writing about women singer and the link that you make between writing about female singer and the alternative narratives of what you, or what you call it, the narrative from below that yeah. challenge the dominated uh, narrative? <clears throat> um. I mean, the musical field is a field uh, very, uh, it's a very male field, especially at its beginning. So it was dominated by men, whether uh, the music production, the sound engineers, the record companies, um, um, and even the audience was mainly man audience. Uh, so the women navigated very, but at the same time, women were at the center because they were the main uh, artists. Um, the record industry and the te sound technologies uh, changed a little bit of this fact, but they remained uh, marginalized. Uh, um, so f female singers were mostly uh, performing at the leisure venues. They were, and when the radio opened, they were one of the, yeah, a lot of um, female singers started singing on the radio. Um, so, like researching um, these women singers first enables you to uh, to to see how they navigated this male uh, business uh, and uh, industry. And you, um, again, when I first started re doing like research on the women singers, I was just fascinated. You know, you have this fascination with the, the divas and the music divas and. Um, you see a picture of them with black and white, uh, very beautiful, always. Uh, and you have, you have a, a certain fascination. But when you start digging, you start realizing how much, actually, it was a very hard field. So my work on the press, and this goes to this, the written archive, um, I found a lot of, um, in the 1930s, a lot of um, articles, like uh, there was a, a journal um, doing interviews because uh, the, the cabarets was like, a place uh, intriguing the intellectuals, the Daba, because you, you're becoming modern, but you have these small de de deviated places of debaucherie and of uh, where women sing and dance and uh, sing very um, obscene songs. So they became like a very a target in the press. So when you go into the press, you can start. Um, you would see like male, always men. Um, criticizing these women. Okay, this is like you would say this, this is normal, you would expect that. But then, uh, as this leisure or the cabaret scene became more and more um, uh, present in the city of Beirut, but also I would say in Damascus, Aleppo, the same, Baghdad, the same, uh, Haifa also. Uh, uh, they were started being intrigued by these women. So they started, they had like a section, a weekly section. Uh, covering the nightlife and talking about the, and interviewing. So I found like these 25 articles or even more weekly interviews with these women singers. So it was the first time that I can hear them. You know, I, I would hear them singing, but it's always songs written by men or, you know, recorded stuff. 
but it was the first time that they were giving the voice to talk about. And most of them were very um, report, like talked in a very sad way about their life. And they always, they, and most of these women try to present themselves as, uh, I am, a I, I would love to be a mother. I would love, I, I was obliged to become a singer, but I had to because I was very poor. I had no other options. And I'm um, the only woman who were proud of being a singer. And this is, I'm talking in 1933, Annie, were the most famous one, really, and the most also um, uh, virtuous and uh, um, uh, recognized in the society as like, um, famous singers. So I started thinking about what does it mean to be a singer at the time and uh, and what are the challenges they have and and the, the notion of diva and how we see women singers as divas started to collapse, especially when, when we talk even about um, the women singers in Egypt, like um, uh, Munir al and we, uh, who was a famous singer in the 1920s, and she had like this very famous cabaret. She was always considered as a diva. Um, you start to think about, okay, what's behind this diva? What's behind this word? And then uh, when the radio opened in the 1930s and 1938, so the 40s in Lebanon and uh, in, in Syria and also in Baghdad, um, in Iraq, there was like a, a, a scene of, uh, of a cabaret scene. So women singers used to circulate um, between the region and but also performing at the radio. So the radio, when it opened in 1938, started publishing a magazine also covering the, uh, the music, uh, the, the nightlife in Baghdad, Beirut, Aleppo, and, uh, and Damascus, and covering the, mostly talking about the women. So always, it's always about the women. The man singer and musician were like, uh, they, they, they were mentioned, but never their personal life, never their, uh, 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 what they are doing, their activities. It's, so the women were always like, um, their, uh, their image portrayed, their body uh, discussed, uh, uh, whether they get married. If they are not married, they were criticized. So you can also see how, how, um, how, how the press and that started at the time also like impacted on the women singers. Um, so I also like discovered another uh, um, totally unknown uh, uh, word for me because um, like Nurul Huda or uh, many singers from the 1950s and 60s that we grew up knowing these women and seeing them also as divas and reading their biographies who are mostly written by men, very badly written, always talking about, um, about them either as diva or as failures. And, and, and you can see how for years she, ha she was like destroyed in the press mm -hmm. uh, because she should not, she, she should sing traditional music and she was like trying to actually know singing like uh, playful songs. Mm -hmm. For me, just to re, uh, recap on all this, thank you, is I see that the, um, uh, there is a double layer in, in this project. Is well, The first one is related to these women singers. Mm. And their stories um, were never um, presented in a way that give them you know, the right of what happened. It was always like a judgment on them. So there is a right to go back to the history of women singers, to, uh, to talk about uh, what they lived, the challenges that they had, the, the, and the, the problems they created. Yeah, they were not saints. They were like uh, fighting with each other. So this, there was like a milieu, like today's music milieu. So you sh there is this thing that I would like to talk about. But also, this enables me to like, look at women in general and how they are silenced in the uh, in the archive, in the history, and how they are marginalized. So, and through this, you can like go a little bit from below and try to uh, to uh, rethink the past in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this brings me, and Diana touched on the historical aspect. Uh, Inanna, this brings me to also the anger that you mentioned that happening in the contemporary life. 
but also to your work about and the gender politics in your work, and maybe you can share with us a, about your coming album. Just share. Yeah, and you can sing if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as I told you when we met, preview, when we met and had the talk in El Berlin. Um, yeah, for me, it started because I I needed to I needed to vent. I need to I needed to release all the tension of the problems that was most the problem that was most pressing of that time when I started writing, which was like, which was basically racism and the darkness of Berlin and uh, hating this really long dark winter and how it affected me as of a as a sun child. And I think that what happened after I actually released all those tracks as, as me, as who I am, the previously <laughs> woman, uh, the currently gender fuck, um, uh, that, that left a weight, you know, like I did not realize the amount of responsibility that I, that I had, basically. It was, I was doing the music for me. I was, I was releasing, pun intended, for me. And after I realized actually um, the weight of me being who I am, uh, putting um, material out there, and all the other queers and gender fucks and women of my world like reaching out to me and being like, wow, like, you are doing this in our language, uh, f as we said, like, from a queer person to queer people and, uh, and or women. And, um, and ev everybody expressing how it meant to them and how important it was for them that someone like me just merely exists, you know, just the existence of me. And then I realized that actually, okay, then there is a huge responsibility behind everything that I am producing. And it's not actually just about me. It has never been just about me, and it will never be just about me. And um, me being who I am, <laughs> and always having this intense need or urge for um, freedom or liberation, uh, meant that I need to proceed in this process, let's say. And therefore, the realizing the responsibility, that's where it came of like, okay, so if, I'm, if I am working for my own liberation, I need to uh, aspire to all of our liberation as women or as trans people or queer people in general. And hence my... Um, the album that I'm working on right now, which will be my debut album. And it's called Queer. And it's going to be the first um, hip hop album in Arabic from a queer trans person to queer, like from a queer Arab speaking person to other queer Arab speaking people. And yeah, it's crazy. It is insane that this does not exist. It does not exist. There is, of course, in, in Arabic music in general, there is um, music about queerness, but often and mostly it is very subtle or very like hidden or very apologetic in a way, you know what I mean? And I am done with being apologetic, I'm done with hiding, I am uh, done with sugarcoating everything so that, oh, please hear me out, you know? Um, and this album is very much about this. It's about visibility, it's about transparency, unapologetically, you know, I am here, we are here, and enough with hiding and all this stuff. And so it is, it is very unapologetic in a sense that it is very direct, it is very honest, and it's very transparent. Um, it is very accessible. It is going to be very accessible. It's a, in a very accessible language. 
and I'm going to be discussing all about queerness and transness and gender in, an, in a very accessible language to everyone that does not have that accessibility to information for anyone. Because, you know, if you don't know what you don't know, you stick to what you know. So if everyone around you is telling you you're wrong, you need to hide, you need to whatever, all, this, uh, all the systems of domination possible, you are going to stick to it because you are in survival mode. And this is how representation really, really matters. What we also talked about last time, like representation changes everything. Because if I, when I was younger, if I had seen someone like me, just existing, you know, just existing, like forget about success, forget about work, forget about anything. Like if I had known that I, I could exist, my whole life would have been different. Mm. Everything that I struggled through would have been like so much less painful. Knowing that you're not alone, knowing that there is hope. And so what I'm trying to do, I think in this album is as I also told you, like um, to be for my people who I needed. I'm trying to be for my people, the person that I needed when I was younger, you know? And if I could make one person's life less miserable, then that is a huge success for me. And yeah. Thank you. This is really very powerful, Inanna. And good Thank luck we you. all, I think, looking forward to hearing Thank the you. album. Me good too. Luck. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> this is the liberation and oppression and maybe the, what, we, what was mentioned by Diana and Inanna brings me to the very direct uh, question for both of you, uh, Mu'min and Muhammad. Uh, sorry for uh, 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 taking the uh, identity as... But we, but we are... Living in, you are both Palestinian, and we know that Palestine and the Palestinians have been facing silencing almost on all fronts. Uh, Germany and Berlin is on the top of it now in silencing Palestinians. So, so I wonder, uh, uh, and maybe my question, and if you can share and, or, or you have thought about, you know, how artists, musicians, performers navigate these political constraints, and. Can and censorship, and is it possible to counter, or how possible, or in what ways is it possible to counter these political power, a uh, global power, but local power uh, in, in regards to the uh, music? Uh, and uh, uh, Jabali, maybe you can share from your work in Jaffa, in Yaffa, also about music and how, <coughs> how the, um, the, how the internet you, used as an archive to maybe overcome borders, especially actual borders between the Palestinians and Israel and the, uh, we, we keep saying the Arab world, but it's, it's the Arab speaking world because there are not only Arabs in the Arab world. So it's also the barriers of the uh, the language. So if you can just reflect on this, um, Muhammad and then uh, Mu'min about silencing Palestinians and Palestine. I, I think it's also in UK, it's not easy. So... Um, it's a very, like, hearing also the different uh, uh, interventions and talks, like, it's a, such a wide, uh, like, I want to talk about so many, touch so many points. Uh, um, like I will just again like speaking from the personal experience I think it's uh, and I want like kind of talk about the technology but also give it a um, kind of um, I said uh, caveat or like put it in a uh, um, like technology matters, it changes a lot in, in how we, uh, how I also experienced things. But I think, and it's obviously like a very interesting question. Like I think there is much way still to research and do and, and, and understand 
For example, in the differences between the different technologies mentioned here, like the record as a physical uh, thing that you can't print at home, and the cassette as a thing that you could record yourself in, and copy, yeah? And I think I personally, like, you know, like other than the archival or the like old uh, archival fever of old uh, records, I find the cassette uh, uh, era uh, 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 extremely interesting just because of the possibility of copying and recording. Uh, I think this made a huge impact on people and what, like from Diana's previous mentioned technologies, the, the radios, yeah. which I don't really understand exactly. I know they had like, a, a, I could have listened to a unauthorized, a, like a pa band if known where it is transformed, it, it transmitted uh, uh, from uh, uh, radios from Palestine from the West Bank, uh, we all grew up on uh, resistance songs that, uh, uh, like talking about cassettes, I one of my childhood memories is while going to have our uh, um, a holiday retreat, like with the family in the north, in the Galilee, my father will cross the green line, go to Tul Karem, and get printed cassettes of PLO music. And cross the green line again, and then continue to the Galilee. And then we, we had PLO music at home, and we had the videos, and we had, so I think the VHSs and the tapes, uh, 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 like of course these materials you could, back then you could get three years in jail if, 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 if it's caught at, at, in, in your closet, uh, uh, at least. But we were doing it, like I remember Firkat al also printed, yani, as a, uh, uh, in in, uh, in Taipei, so it was also part of. Uh, uh, I think this is extremely interesting. So, uh, um, I think like what I can add to it is the the internet in some way as we experience it, maybe as a generation, maybe you know like previous generation would say the same thing about the radio or the cassette or the different technologies is. Uh, and for me, it was very powerful to uh, be in the moment and, and to think about like the uh, connection between um, uh, the Arab Spring moment as a uh, uh, as a happening, its relation to social media, and its relation to like let's say social media in its early phases, even before its. Uh, 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 like today, it's a very well uh, algorithmed and organized, much more controlled social media than this 10, 15 years ago social media. Like I remember, for example, posts from Tunis while Tunis is happening, popping in my feed. In the way algorithms are built today, this will never happen. I will only see my echo chamber and... Uh, uh, but back then, like, riots were happening in Tunis, and it was in my feed. Uh, and I, I had no, zero mutual friends with, with, with I, I, I can't even like understand why was it in my feed. So, and the same, I think, happened with the uh, 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 uploading things to YouTube. Like suddenly, <clears throat> Uploading things to YouTube, uh, managing to buy a, a, a marginally released, uh, you know, like very vintage margin releases albums from Beirut or Cairo, from the alternative scene, through the internet suddenly, like you land a digital album directly released a week ago uh, in your laptop and you can play it in Jaffa and Haifa. You could realize that it's, uh, um, like especially like this, I think I would like to touch ab about also like the idea of being a, a, a what 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 is an Arab as an identity while living under the Israeli hegemony that is claiming to represent all liberated freedom forces in the world, while the Arab represents like the uh, primitive uh, conservative backward. 
uh, 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 unliberated uh, uh, body or self, or, or uh, I don't know if it has even agency to call it a self in the Israeli uh, way of, of, of uh, binaries. Uh, but this, like struggling for, for young people, matching their, like, I think this is also what Inanna touched. It's like seeing themselves represented through the internet era in other cities and realizing that it's not, uh, uh, you know, like it's not a Western creation to be a liberated self. It's like that you could be a liberated self also as a historical being, also as a self that has an agency, and it exists in, in, in a normal way, and you could speak it in Arabic, and you could... Uh, I think this experience, uh, uh, music also plays a lot to it, but music plays a lot to it as a happening in this meaning, like in the meaning of, like for example, uh, of a kind of transformation on this, uh, 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 obscene uh, experiences in the cabaret that Diana was describing. It's like creating these obscene experiences, experiencing it, and experiencing it in Arabic or in your language between your community is a, a liberating experience. On the other hand, I would say it's also in music, like just because of the nuances of understanding or not understanding what has been said in the language, okay, or the little nuances and references that a song can make, it also can create a very strong signaling in minority, like when you play minority music in predominant other languages experiences. Like you could have played uh, a stream of Dabka songs in Tel Aviv, yeah, and only the Arab-speaking people in the in, in the uh, hall would understand that one song among the stream of seemingly very dancey Debka song was actually a Palestinian resistance song, <laughs> because the other people don't understand the language and they hear the rhythms, and then you get a signaling. You could signal people this way, you know. It's like you could. A signal and give legitimacy to certain experiences in this, in, 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 like in this creation of this space, music as a space, and then it's like making it have have something meaningful. So this I just not to take because I could speak for hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about silencing, about what artists, oh, okay. how they navigate. <clears throat> if you feel want to add anything to this and you can just also reflect on other things had been said here about technology or materiality of so it's the mic is yours <laughs> yeah I mean it's interesting because um, I mean we are in a place here it's, it's good to look back a little bit and then look at what was happening during the Second World War here in Germany in Berlin and if we want to look for example at uh, Wolf of Benjamin uh, the Jewish philosopher who uh, uh, who was, uh, um, he, he basically um, uh, executed himself, he killed himself in, in the border in Spain. I don't know if, um, if any references? Okay, cool, <laughs> everyone doing this way. Um, so it's interesting because, um, uh, you know, in his book, The, uh, um, uh, the uh, Reproduction of the Art and uh, he spoke a lot, and, the, and the, also the text of the fragments, the fragment sticks, and the, the violence uh, that he spoke a lot about. Um, um, I would, I want to, I want to take it from this angle because he spoke about, about the copyright, which is the first time to spoke about the copyright, and and I think this is very important. So we Palestinians have no copyright over our work, for example, like um, 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 uh, uh, various uh, uh, Israeli. Um, archivist or artist or filmmaker will simply use our archive and make a movie and come here and premiere it in Germany and Berlin and Berlinale without having any uh, intellectual uh, uh, agreement property from any Palestinian artist. And that's personally happened with me. And this is even more than silencing. This is also like, this is sort of um, 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 even like telling your own narrative 
in 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 a bla in a time that you actually not agreeing with and you know what I mean so um and this is for me it's really interesting to look at it from from this perspective and and also if we want to talk about it from like a science way which is um um uh, I will look at it from like sort of a, a vertical and and horizontal uh point of view so um that's what was my question earlier on about did did actually sound make different for resisting and for liberation or it doesn't make difference you know um so if if it does make different how and it doesn't make different how and in wh where is this in term of science and in, in in term of like um how how we want to sort of explore and tackle the whole the whole research and understand this point of like um, again about the sound making different in the political debate or or it doesn't in the end of the day but for me the most important things again like um um uh, yeah, like as a Palestinian, I don't feel uh, voiceless. Uh, like I, I feel like my voice is pretty amplified nowadays and pretty strong. And um, and um, um, uh, yeah, it's an interesting time. Um, I mean, I feel sad of what happened last Monday in in, in Germany here in Berlin to uh, to stop the pa Palestinian demonstration. Even though I'm not a nationalist, like I'm not calling for another state and another police and another army and another flag is just, um, you know, like a, a minority wanted to just uh, amplify their voice. I think they should be able to. And uh, uh, I mean, not that in other places in, in, in Europe is, uh, is much more accessible for Palestinian. No, I think it's the same. And also the other point I think is um, I just want to touch on is venue. Venue is very important, so I feel like uh, venue is not really accessible for the brown and black people in, in most of, um, um, uh, uh, I mean, here in Berlin, you guys are very lucky that you run your own venue, and so you can do your own programming. And uh, But also theater, for example, like theater is very important, so taking that I come from a theater background, I feel like the, nar the narrative of theater have always driven by white people because it run by white people in most of the places. In the UK, they have escaped this point because they sort of um, um, employ uh, 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 black artists. And by employing black artists, they think that, oh, they have now gathered the diversity of, of um, and, and um, so, sort of overcome the obstacle of, um, of the question of, of accessible venue. But also, you know, there's a lot of like, um, uh, brown, Asian, Middle Eastern uh, artists that they have zero access and zero uh, decision making in venues is, is um, so all, all of those points I think it's not like sort of um, asking is I think it's sort of like um, um, because asking it will, 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 will leave us in the same question of vertical and horizontal uh, uh, but basically it's more of um, sharing the, the, the knowledge and the ideas and, and, and making the space big enough for everyone uh, to, to have their voice to be heard. Um, yeah, I think, I think those, those elements are, are really important. I will just give a small little example from the archive of, of silencing Palestinian. Um, so there's a guy called George Kormuz. George Kormuz um, have uh, five Palestinian uh, jazz uh, album that was released uh, from 1972 till uh, 1988. Um, and he written most of his uh, albums uh, inside the Israeli jail. And uh, uh, one of his albums uh, called From Ansar to Askalan, which is this is where he were jailed between these two jails. And, um, and then when he came out, basically, um, he recorded them. And, um, and, and became the most popular Palestinian uh, albums in, during the 80s. Um, so this is for me like a very, very important um, uh, example. Also, uh, Zainab Shath. Zainab Shath, the uh, first Palestinian singer to release a seven inches uh, uh, um, uh, vinyl um, in English. And it was recorded in 1971 in Lebanon 
and was filmed by uh, Palestinian painter uh, 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 Shamut, uh, uh, Ismail. Ismail Shamut, uh, yeah, and um, <clears throat> and basically uh, the Israeli when uh, they invaded Beirut in 1982. Uh, they uh, have taken all the Israel, uh, all the Palestinian archive from the uh, 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 the PLO uh, uh, media office in in, in Beirut, and um, so me as my generation, I would not ever uh, have heard of this album without an Israeli archivist um, have releasing the music video of Ismail Shamut uh, uh, of Zainab Shath in the mountain, uh, in the in the. Um, uh, uh, um, in uh, in South Lebanon, uh, uh, so she re she released this uh, footage uh, as part of her exhibition, mm -hmm. without accrediting the actual artist in there, and then so we had to see this um, a friend who filmed it on a on Tel Aviv museum, and then um, obviously later on she had to write about it. Oh yeah, and this is came from here and there, and uh, I, uh, I was given permission to go to the Israeli military archive, and I found this fascinating video, and then I put it on my exhibition, and I am the curator of this exhibition. So basically we have, yeah, I mean, without this, um, basically we would have, we would, she would be still silent and now, you know, and we are actually reissuing the album uh, in October. Yeah, thank you, Mo'min, but this brings me also to the story that I've heard from you that uh, about the distribution of the cassettes. Oral history is also another source. It's not only the actual archive that Israel confiscated or reappropriated or whatsoever, but also the, the story of the people and of telling, and especially of songs and lyrics and music and sounds. It's, it's also a counter hegemonic for silencing and for uh, eliminating or for trying to erasing specific history. So it's, it's really the combination between, you know, you have the actual archive, the material, but you also have the people who tell the story and, and the songs that, you know, you release so new generation will know about it, so it's, it's also another way of archiving the, his, the, the present and the, and the past. Uh, I think we are running out of time, and we still have 30 minutes, and I want to dedicate this to your question, but maybe if you can briefly, because I want to touch on what we talked earlier, you all uh, uh, touched upon the being away from home or l being in Berlin or Inanna, in your case, the move that you did from writing in English into writing into English and a bit Arabic and then in releasing an album almost on only in Arabic, but also about uh, the in interaction the performance. You all perform, Diana, you write and you reflect on festivals in your writings, a, a music festival in your writings, to perform in a Western maybe a, a spaces with non-Arab audience, but also maintaining the connection as an artist, but also as a producer, as a DJ with the audiences back home. So if you can just briefly reflect on being in exile, diaspora, away from where you were born, a, Briefly, it will be really great. I, I have uh, the, the, the clear answer for this. Yeah, so basically, as a Palestinian, <laughs> because we are more outside of Palestine than inside Palestine. Yeah. You know, this philosophy, we are inside the outside. Uh, so for me, it makes sense to be based uh, in, in, in London, mm. in East London, uh, especially the, this new modern sound uh, uh, um, uh, culture in in London that coming up from the you know the drill the hip hop the grime all of this is interesting for me to be based there, mm -hmm. and also interesting because uh, there is over what, ten million Palestinian now outside of Palestine, so it's good to to be in in this position, um, reaching the Palestinian inside Palestine I think is much easier because you know they still. There, they are, they are much more updated in the new upcoming artists more than us outside. And, um, but I, I just want to say this, this is for me makes sense 100% to be outside of Palestine doing this project yeah. and, and reaching the Palestinian diaspora. Thank you. Inanna? I will say something, yeah. Um, it is 
it is in a way bitter, bittersweet, you know, but the good thing about it is having having the space for a voice because I, let's face it, if I was still in Damascus right now, I would not have been able to write any of this stuff, nor record it, nor release it. And um, this is also the power of social media these days and like Instagram equals accessibility. So all of my people, let's say all the teenage, queer, trans, um, whatever gender folks that are stuck in Damascus without any... Yeah, f when I was a teenager, I had no accessibility whatsoever to any of this information. You know, you had to, you had to dig for it uh, really hard and also whatever you would find does not actually represent you. So it also paints like a totally um, misconceived um, perception of what the world is because what the world will be like for me is not like how it is for a white person. And yeah, oh, this is why I thought the West is utopia also, you know, because I thought, oh yeah, I will get that too, you know. But no, a white person's story does not represent me. They did not live my experience. They did not live my story. They do not have uh, the. They do not have to face all the systems of domination and oppression that I have to every single day. You know, whether living there or living here. And I think this is like the great part about it is that I'm here and I there is social media is that you can yeah transfer all this knowledge or information uh, to all all the others that are there you know and yeah this is a good thing I lost my plot again but <laughs> but yeah like. Uh, uh, some some people would write me like and tell me, yeah, no, it is important that you do this in our language, that you do this from us, for us, you know, because a white person does not represent me. They do not, they don't even have a clue about our experience and how it is to navigate all of those things and uh, all of these circumstances as well. And so as much as it's evil, but still thank God for Instagram, you know, because you can give, <laughs> you can share this information still. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Diana or Mohammed, one of you. Um, uh, yeah, very briefly, I mean, um, as on a personal level, uh, I felt exiled in Lebanon much more than I feel exiled in, uh, in Berlin. I mean, uh, so, I, I connected with so many people uh, here in Berlin, like, uh, and uh, it opened um, the possibility to meet also with you and a lot of Palestinians coming from the the blood. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so yeah, yeah. I mean, the feeling of exile is here. The feeling of being away of home. The feeling of uh, looking for a home is is here definitely. But it was also there when when I was in Lebanon. And I'm think I think a lot of people like shared this feeling. Um, uh, and and actually, I'm very interested even in, in my work on reflecting and thinking about this, what is exile and what is the notion of home and what it means to be in exile and what, what it means to be in exile through songs and through music. And um, there is like, um, uh, to go back a little bit of, of what Mu'min said at the beginning of this talk and the talk about the, the question of nostalgia and no, no, no nostalgia. And I, I, I do agree in a way that um, in our world, the nostalgia, and especially in the 1970s and 80s was always, and in exile was related to the home nation and to the state and to the beautiful mountains and the sea and the, this Im imaginary uh, nation, you know, that crushed us, uh, th um, you know, through all these years. And today it, it's lost, but uh, what, What's left is, and this is what's nice in, in uh, the songs that are written today, especially rap songs and uh, hip hop, and I, I, like what I talked about in Wael El Cox's uh, last um, concert at Al Berlin, but also all these songs that by Um Kulsum, by Arras, or so many others, that like are recollecting the past and going to. Th um, 
to talk about stories from the past, so, and not in a nostalgic way, on the contrary, it's just to recollect the past and tell again the stories of this past to rewrite our own history and uh, break with this official narrative. So, yeah, this is like to talk very briefly. Thank you. I think I mentioned some parts of okay. like this question for like ironically speaking uh, I'm, I'm more into the Arab world and the Arab speaking world here in Berlin than back in Taipei, Jaffa, Haifa or even Jerusalem. It's like here I'm free from the Israeli restraint on my activity. I'm not uh, I'm not promoting uh, uh, the image of, uh, like, my success here less, uh, less counter eff uh, effect, like, less counter attack me because it's like our success is always is related to promoting Israel as a liberal democracy because here, you see, minorities succeed. So it's like here, at least, I'm succeeding without promoting the, uh, the apartheid. So it's like, <laughs> so my successes here are less counter attacking me than there. Uh, this is one thing. And ironically, here I'm out of the iron curtain of the Israeli apartheid. Here I'm connecting to the world, connecting to the Arab uh, community and have connection to the Arab world much more than inside the iron curtain uh, of the Israeli occupation. Uh, so that makes it, uh, you know, like a very, that's why I'm here. It's like, it's, uh, I would have been there if these restraints weren't, uh, like it's a better weather. That's, uh, that's for sure. But uh, you sacrifice some, you win some. It's, uh, and the other thing, it's like, you know, it's the motherland. Like it's the motherland, there are, we come from the colonies into the motherland, the wealth exists in the center, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in order to succeed, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, self-explanatory from there on. It's uh, wealth. <laughs> wealth exists more in the center. So it's... Uh, so the same goes uh, in a way for, uh, for living under the system of Al-Assad, for example. Yeah, yeah. The mic. Uh, Yes, now uh, it's your turn to, quest to have a question. We have one here, so you wanted Amir and you? Okay. Hi, um, thank you everyone. This is super, super interesting. Um, but I have a question for Diana. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation <coughs> that uh, you use technology as a research tool um, to connect different countries, so uh, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt. And um, so Egypt is a very big consumer of streaming, of music streaming internationally, like um, more or less behind the United States or something. So it is huge there. And um, yeah, uh, my questions are, how do you think that streaming has affected this connection between this uh, set of countries? And uh, what do you think about streaming as a counterculture tool? Counterculture tool. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you want to answer now or to collect? Um, yeah, maybe Amir. collect. Yeah, so maybe Amir. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, they will answer after. We will collect uh, question and have a round of. Well, uh, can you just give the microphone for the streaming? Oh, yeah. I don't normally use microphones, but uh, uh, no, my question is about the last part that you talked about. It's, um, um, I just like, uh, out of curiosity, how, how do you feel that, uh, like creating this uh, interconnected uh, um, Arab culture uh, in Europe or in outside uh, Palestine, outside the boundaries that Israel can impose upon us and um, how, how do you feel that can help with like uh, countering uh, like to be more specific is how do you feel that leaving yeah. the state to the Israeli hegemony can yeah. <laughs> can 
help uh, uh, stopping it or educating the people that are like day to day living under the influence of a lot of of uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, thanks for putting this wonderful panel together. My, uh, like, it's not a question, it's more of a, I, I just want to know more about it. And it's, it's directed towards Moomin. Uh, so Moomin, um, uh, uh, like, I would want to know more about the music that's coming directly from, like, the uh, occupied territories. Uh, what uh, I understand, uh, you were you were able to uh, find out this artist huge collection, and then you re-released it, right? Uh, I would want to know more about what kind of music is being produced, and what kind of coercion comes from the state. How does it work? How is it navigated? Thank you. Thanks a lot for a wonderful panel. I have one uh, clarification. What Momin was asked, talking about taking away the copyright. So do you mean that this thing of PLO archives being taken, you know, then they using it? Or is it other way, you know, what is this way in which Palestinians work is used and then it screens in Berlinale without any problem? I didn't quite understand that. Is it the archive you're talking about? And another thing which I wanted to ask generally is, how do the social media function under the state control. For example, what Mohammed you were talking about, the algorithm. So in India, it's like, uh, this, I mean, there is a kind of a relationship with the company and the state. So it's very difficult for you to do opposing work within the social media, you know, due to n number of circumstances. So how easy, for example, if it is there, you know, if you're putting up something on the social media within Israel, you know, in Israel, within Israel, is it possible to view it? Do, do they make the company take it down, what is the relationship with the state and the company there? Okay, so uh, we start, Diana, yeah. with you. Um, so maybe to, I, I would like answer a bit quickly because um, on, this, on this question, uh, first, I, I think Hamad also talked a little bit about the importance of the internet and the streaming on the, and, and yeah, Definitely, it's um, uh, uh, it's made uh, much more accessible uh, 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 the music produced in Egypt. But I would like to say that, and maybe it's something that we always joke about also here, that Egypt is like a whole country or a whole uh, co uh, continent. I mean, or Kaukab, uh, like um, a planet. Uh, it's. Yeah, you you can access it, but uh, it's it's hard and uh, and it's it's a whole different planet and and we we feel it actually when we are here in in, in Berlin like the connection that you can you try to go into uh, uh, this culture uh, into Egypt's culture or groups, but it's um, uh, uh, it it's hard. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm sure there is like, a, and still are a very deep connection between Bilal Sham and and, uh, and and Egypt. But also like um, uh, 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 Tanafus or um, the com 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 um, a competition, and uh, so and and streaming was also definitely a way to counter culture because uh, and and if you go into the music scene, it was and me as a historian, um, uh, it was a way. It it actually it enabled uh, uh, all the records that were the, uh, in the private uh, uh, collection of, uh, um, of many uh, Arab collectors, to, it went on, on, on the net. So they, they started and to, after 2006 to make like uh, uh, websites uh, for these collectors and putting all these uh, uh, songs on the internet. And that was a, a, a huge shift and made this archive accessible to so many things, uh, so many people. Uh, uh, especially after 2006, and it was a way also to review the history of music, to review how we, uh, the music was written, and to rediscover a totally new uh, 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 music, not new, I mean uh, music of the early 20th century, who was completely marginalized, absent, and not uh, uh, archived or talked about. So uh, what we call the Nahda music, or the music that was at the beginning of the 20th century. 
Uh, you have uh, Muhammad, you have a question, and Mu'min. So. The copyrights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Arshia, I would say, uh, for Arshia first, thank you for coming, Arshia. Uh, so basically about the what kind of genres of, of music um, uh, it, that was sort of part of it. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like um, um, we mentioned it in this earlier on, like um, uh, uh, about like is actually there something called Palestinian music, or there's something called uh, uh, like uh, German music, or what is it exactly? So we, I asked myself also the same question all the time. But in terms of what genres happen, like in the archive, there is um, a lot of jazz. Uh, there is a lot of uh, retro music. And there's a lot of psychedelic, okay? Uh, uh, there's also uh, a lot of acid and, and, and disco. And so the disco and funk, I would say, not that much in the Palestinian uh, sound, but there's more sort of uh, uh, acid, jazz, uh, uh, folk music, yeah, folk music, countryside, I would say, music. Hmm? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, acoustic, a lot of acoustic. But uh, yeah, but those acoustic sometimes also take into a different uh, uh, genre places. Uh, in the in the term in term of new moderns, there's a lot of samples, a lot of samples coming out now from Palestine. A lot of grime, hip hop, uh, outsell of a spoken word coming out. A lot of experimental uh, sound sound artists coming, like uh, look up, for example, Dirar Kalash. It's like uh, somebody who's really pushing the jazz music to a different place. Uh, um, also, um, Balatinum, like, they're doing like an amazing uh, scene in terms of grime music now coming out from Palestine. Uh, the, the, um, the Palestinian archive sound uh, is not really uh, um, it's not really accessible yet, but there is a few a few uh, LP that uh, we just reissued uh, as part of the project. So uh, one of them is um, completely um, acid, retro, and disco. Uh, uh, was released called the Antifada, and it was uh, all the all the copy were taken in in the first Antifada by the Israelis. So this this album was never seen the light before. And we have uh, George Kormuz, the album that was written inside the jail is completely jazz, like completely piano and guitar, uh, and a uh, little of like a little bit of drum kick. Um, there is uh, we just also uh, Giuliano Merchamis, Giuliano Merchamis, who was like uh, pa the pa the founder of the Freedom Theater uh, that we worked uh, with. I personally worked with for seven years in the Freedom Theater before he were politically assassinated outside the Freedom Theater because of his theater work. And uh, so we just releases um, uh, a, comp a compilation of, of, of um, um, an interview with him about his idea of what's happening in Palestine now. And, and uh, we worked with young uh, music producers like Chick Point 303 uh, from Tunisia. And, um, um, uh, yeah, and th there is some uh, uh, rock music that also came out from the 80s and the 70s, like I shot it, uh, uh, the uh, Anarchy Fada uh, band. I'm not sure if you have. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an anarchy band, Palestinian anarchy band from the 80s, from Haifa. Uh, yeah, so about, about uh, copyright and, and archive, I mean, for me, I, from now, nowadays, I see I, everything I see as archive, like what I just have said, it became archive already. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we had a bad experience with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with filmmakers coming to Palestine, taking footage and leaving and then, and then making a movie out of it without making a second contact, asking for, you know, like a copyright or at least like contract or, so we had a lot of a problem with this. And I obviously references to Barinali because this happened a few times with the Barinali that when we written to the Barinali, but but they obviously always will take the side of the filmmaker. Without consent. Sorry. Without consent. Yeah, yeah. Without consent. 
Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Because obviously, I mean, uh, the situation in Palestine that if you are a Palestinian, you're living uh, 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 like uh, the life of like um, uh, 10 class citizens, you know, it's not like second not class citizen. <laughs> Uh, so basically, uh, any artists who holding Israeli ID, uh, they think that it's easy for them to come to the West Bank, do whatever you, they want, and then go and present it. And they know that they, as a Palestinian, they can't sue them and take them to court, or or like ask for copyright because we don't have a, a right to exist anyway for their opinion. You know, like um, so. Yeah, it's difficult, really difficult. Um, so where to start? I, I will uh, have something like just another uh, uh, streaming as a counterculture and technology internet. Uh, I also wanted to add to what uh, Diana said that probably is what makes the internet or in general different is the ability for private uploads. Like I think this, is, I think it's a strong uh, point because talking about archives, uh, uh, private uploads to the internet change the hegemonic picture or any like can change hegemonic uh, a picture we want to see on certain uh, uh, historical moments. Like for example, uh, you could uh, remember, for example, Sheikh Imam is a famous Egyptian. Uh, uh, resistant, uh, like very communist, Marxist, uh, going to jail, out of jail, out like always very popular uh, neighborhood uh, singer with just an oud and lyrics and his accompanying poet, Ahmad Fouad Nijem, uh, which is like George Cormus sings yeah. one of Ahmad Fouad Nijem's uh, uh, poems in this, and it, yeah. it was amazing moment, played it on our bar two in the morning, and I said, damn, it's like I haven't heard this song in our house, it didn't play for 30 years at least. It's like, uh, uh, so this, for example, Sheikh Imam, then it's like talking about experiencing of being Palestinian inside Israel without connection to the Arab world. So of course I heard all of the, like not national, but uh, like resistance, you know, like respectful, let's call it, uh, uh, songs of Sheikh Imam. I never heard Sheikh Imam had a flirting song, I, I never, uh, he, I, I heard only one love song he performed. And then you go to YouTube, suddenly there's YouTube, there's Egypt, and people just upload their private archives, and suddenly there is sittings like in a kind of like very uh, working class room in Mahalla or in a very working class neighborhood with Najib Sroor, Ahmad Fouad Nijim, Sheikh Imam is singing. The room is packed with men and women working class uh, 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 people packed, packed, and they're singing songs that today, uh, the women are singing with them, and uh, today it will be like, like the lyrics are almost a sexual harassment <laughs> lyric. Like it's, it's a very, uh, like a very Egyptian uh, flirting song, so it's like it changes also these aspects of how we remember resistance uh, uh, figures, you know? Because private uploads make this nuances, make this uh, glimpses, uh, possible in, in, in a more colorful image of, of uh, the national uh, uh, archiving way. And um, just as a quick uh, joke, because streaming is, in Egypt, everything goes in a different numbers. So between us, like for when we try to imagine if we're bringing a musician, how much crowd he will have, and we say, then one say, hey, uh, he has four million views on YouTube. And say, is he Egyptian? Says, yeah, say, no, he's nobody in Egypt. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> because, uh, and another comment, like, because you made, you reminded me that you should remember that, we should remember that also mobile, a Wi-Fi, all of this accessibility, it's not only accessible, sometimes you need to look what, uh, uh, why? Like because I think mobile uh, uh, streaming is makes it much more accessible for upload and download, but also like who holds the mobile company? Uh, 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 like, is it like probably it's paying someone to to? Because I remember at certain point in the Syrian revolution, 
the Assad regime was getting much more money by shutting the uh, line phones and you, making people use the mobile because it was going f funding the uh, uh, regime back, even though that people were saying, hey, they're having mobile phones, they can upload videos. He didn't care about videos resistance and or like protests. It's like, okay, upload. You wanna like uh, the world see this demo? Like upload, nobody cares about the demo. You're gonna get bombarded nevertheless. Meanwhile, I'm getting the money and getting the bombs, you know? So it's uh, sometimes it's a very tricky technology-wise. Uh, uh, like so, regarding censorship on social media in Israel, I think we were talking mostly about cultural product that has very subtle resistant aspect in them. You get you get censored in social media. You get you, you get in, invited for a, a secret police investigation on a certain posts on social media in Israel. It's like, so it, it happens. Censorship on social media, it's not, not everything you could community organize on social media. Like, uh, it can get dangerous. Yeah, and when you arrive to Tel Aviv uh, airport, they ask you to open your airport. Yeah, and you could be asked to open your airport. Yeah, this is good advice uh, uh, to delete your account ah. before. <laughs> <laughs> to delete it from your account, yeah. devices. Yeah. I'll have last, uh, sorry for taking so much time, leaving uh, or uh, not leaving, yeah? I think I don't have a, a I wasn't preaching for leaving uh, Palestine. It's, uh, I think it's a very, uh, Anna, I have a very mixed feeling toward it. No, no, I was asking this, uh, like... Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I, I'm just saying, yeah, fee, I feel very, I have very mixed feelings about it. How does it help, like, really? How, how do you think that, uh, like, having uh, this interconnectedness in Europe, which I personally like because I live, still live in uh, Palestine slash occupied. <laughs> so it's like, uh, but for me personally, I, I feel that sometimes, like, even if we want to, Two days ago, I was walking in uh, uh, in Karl Marx Church, and I saw somebody having a Palestinian flag. Yeah. Okay. I never saw that in Palestine. Karl Marx, Strasse, Karl Marx Strasse and Zorin Alesh Strasse has more uh, 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 signs in Arabic and Palestinian flags than Jaffa. Yeah? It's like, it's a really like, uh, uh, South, like uh, Ring, South Ring uh, Neukölln is, is more Palestinian than Jaffa. It's like, it's, uh, and it, for me it was shocking already in 2012, like to see that the hummus I eat in uh, Azam back then was better than the hummus I eat in Jaffa, and there is more signs in Arabic on the street than the signs in Jaffa. It's like, you know, it's like Israel is such a harsh, uh, like, reality in this sense. That you come here, you see more uh, Palestinian free expression than uh, what you get in, in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, but I think it's, it's the in and out yeah, that makes the difference. I think um, 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 like uh, last May was a very harsh uh, feeling for me coming back here. Because it felt that, uh, like, with such an uprising, uh, yeah, I would, I would uh, rather be there when uprisings are happening, and rather be here when it's dead, when it's like nothing, when uh, there is no real resistance happening. But it's, I think, it's, it's also part of the personal quest in life, and also part of reconnecting, but on a personal level and also on a community level, I think, this. Uh, access to Europe and back, and having the Arab world through Europe is, is, is a new opportunity. Thank you. This has really been fascinating. So, Mu'min, I, I can see everyone else later, but I won't see you again, maybe. So I have to ask you this question. If I understood you correctly, much of the reissuing or releasing is going to happen on cassettes, right? Um, and if it come to me, Mu'min, I would love to do this because uh, business-wise, I think the cassette is making a big back okay. uh, and uh, it's cheaper to make it and faster. But uh, my other colleagues in the, uh, in, the, in the collective, they 
they much more into vinyl. So yeah, it's gonna come in vinyl. Because my question to you is really like trying to think about this from a historical arc, right? When you compare it to how what Jabali was talking about, the terms of dissemination, what does it mean? And your example that Timot was also discussing, you buy something, then you pick up a ticket from a falafel sandwich. Even I'm thinking right now from it, from the streaming perspectives that we have, there is so much shadow banning on Palestine, so much. So I'm trying to think, how will, this, how will there be another counter, counter alternative medium to be able to disseminate the, this music? Because in reality, the resistance is gonna to be too layered right now. It's not only gonna be the ability to relaunch and release, but also how to get through all these algorithms, the shadow banning. Like I have an artist friend that does anything about Palestine, gets shadow banned, and he has over 70,000 followers. But if we were to do something about Germany or something about America, it's everywhere. But every time there's a word Palestine, it's shadow banned. My and I'm. Shadow yeah, Syria can be shadow banned. And it's Actually, like. And Palestine. Like anything political that is like on the So uh, I'm just thinking out loud with you. I don't, I don't want an answer, but like, how can we think about this from the perspective of resisting on another layer to be able to avoid the tropes of going back to like these cassettes being smuggled or what Khomeini actually did? Long before, when you think about revolutions, how they began, Khomeini was smuggling cassettes from Paris to Tehran. So we know for a fact that maybe old school cassettes and vinyls maybe would do a great comeback. But in terms of streaming, because we can access millions, the shadow banning aspect to me is like is another layer of resistance. And I'm just thinking out loud with you, how can we navigate it to basically target to maneuver out of it to the extent that we can maneuver out of it, bearing in mind that a demonstration is being canceled and being suppressed in Berlin, let alone what you see in the US and elsewhere. So just thinking out loud and... Yeah, I mean, um, good thinking. I mean, I think about it all the time too. Um, we, have, we have more options. We have several options for this. Uh, either we uh, bang the rich Arabs and, and try to buy uh, a you know, company like Facebook and Twitter, and we lead, okay, uh, or uh, we actually, uh, you know, like uh, communicate in a daily basis with uh, such like like today now, you know, I'm sure we have did an outreach today to a new people who otherwise never have heard about the Palestinian music, and um, and uh, and uh, you know play it in a, a nightclub and make a space for it. Play it after twelve when everybody drunk so they can't dance on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, well, I mean, to be honest, we're not, we're not an online platform so far. Uh, we are printing mainly, so um, I, as I mentioned earlier, so each releases of our release have either 1,000 copy or 2,000 copy, okay? And, and we have a distributor, Grab It Up. I would love to shout out to them. They're amazing uh, uh, friends and colleague from Glasgow. <coughs> Uh, and um, and they distribute for us in over than 85 uh, record stores across the world, like everywhere. So when our release come come out, straight away will be distributed in record store and record shop. I think that's that's we are like uh, not because we want to avoid the sh shadowing on the Palestinian history from the social media, but it's just uh, uh, make good money in a short time and that will survive the label. Uh, online streaming, to be honest, I'm gonna be very honest, like um, most of my friends are really famous hip hop artists from Palestine, like Shabbi Jdeed, for example, a really good friend of mine. I don't think he's making money from online streaming as much as they're making money from uh, live gigs. You know, like online streaming, basically Spotify give 16% from any artist online streaming to the most popular artists, like for example, they will take 16% uh, from you as an upcoming artist without asking you, okay, and they will give it to, uh, 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 let's say, um, yeah, Kanye West. West, exactly, exactly. I don't know if you know about this. So I don't, I don't think uh, artists will make money from online streaming, like uh, the max money they can receive a monthly, couple of hundred quid. That's like 300 or 400, at least if you have like uh, over 16 million view every week or every, every month, maybe you will make a couple of thousand. But you know, like it's still, it's still not really money in terms of like if you make an, 
uh, uh, an album and you press it on physical, you'd be able to make 30,000 30, grand okay, within two weeks. Um, and, then, and then leave the streaming to do whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The next round table, we will have it on political economy of uh, music and streaming and printing and producing. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for your amazing contribution and really, really interesting uh, uh, intervention. And thank you for being with us until now. And see you on Saturday. I'll see you tomorrow. Ciao.